want them to understand maybe you've got a particular dress code that's part of your culture. Right? You want them to respond to customers in a particular way. That's part of the culture that you have established, whatever it is. You gotta help people get acclimated to that. And then finally, we want people to feel like they're connected to the organization. How many of you have ever had jobs where you came in brand new and it took weeks or months before you really felt connected to the organization, before you felt like I I'm really a part of this group? Right? It's very easy for us after we've been in an organization or department for a while to kind of develop our little subgroups or little cliques and things like that. We've got to remember when we bring folks in, they, they don't have that connection with us, so we've got to help them make that connection. Now, question for you before we go any further. Who are we going to onboard? Okay, new hires, that's kind of the first thing that comes to mind. New Any, department. New department. If they're coming from a different department, maybe. New leaders. How about vendors? Volunteers. Kind of volunteers. Contractors. Right? Anybody that is coming into the organization or is maybe changing positions within the organization. So keep in mind when we talk about an onboarding process, we're not strictly just talking about new hires, right? We've got to consider that and we've got to build steps into those process to consider these other people. Can I ask a question? Yes. How many of you um, utilize an appropriate use policy for a home board? Um, what about for a contractor at home boards? <coughs> I know that at Brunswick County we don't do anything as far as the contractors and we should. Uh, that's one thing we consider. Yeah. Absolutely, vendors and contractors, and as you mentioned, being volunteers. They're probably the last group we think about really running through an onboarding process. But particularly from an IT perspective, and particularly if they've got to have access to our network or access to our applications, pretty important that we make sure they have the appropriate access so they can do what they need to do, but so they have the appropriate access so they can't do things they're not supposed to do as well, right? We do students. Yeah, there you go. Another group. So things to consider there when we're talking about onboarding. It's not just brand new hires coming in off the street. Okay, by the same token, how about offboarding? So let's define that. Well, that's kind of the reverse, right? It's the removal of an entity from your identity and access management system. Again, kind of a technical definition, but pretty accurate. Offboarding should be a strategic process for transitioning entities out of an organization. Very important word here, strategic. We don't want this to be haphazard. We want to have a plan in place ahead of time. We want to have a purpose and a reason for how we structure this offboarding process. I'm going to suggest to you that the offboarding process is probably more important than the onboarding process because if you've got people coming in, into the organization or they're transitioning within the organization, we're going to figure out how to get them what they need eventually, right? Even if we don't do a very good job of it. We've got to figure out how to get them plugged into what they need to be plugged into or they're not going to be able to do any work. Offboarding? Employee doesn't care, they're gone. They care less what you do with their access. But do we want folks hanging around out there in the system? We want folks still having Windows access to the system a month after they've left the organization or to a particularly critical application. We've got some categories of folks here uh, that we might consider all 40 people that separate voluntarily. Pretty easy, right? We usually have a little advance notice on that. Transfers within the organization, we mentioned that earlier. We typically don't think about including those people in the offboarding process, but what if we had somebody that transferred from the payroll department to engineering? Probably pretty important to go ahead and, and do some things to make sure that they have the access they need in engineering and to take away that payroll access, right? You don't want an engineer sitting down here a month later 
being able to fiddle around with your payroll files. Something to think about. Folks that retire, again, probably get a little more advanced notice on that. This is the bugaboo, I think, right here for most of us, involuntary separation. Because that can happen really quickly. And as we'll see here in just a few minutes, we don't always get a lot of notice when people leave the organization or when they transfer in. And if they leave involuntarily, maybe they have an axe to grind with us and maybe they have motive for doing some not so nice things if we continue to let them have access to our network and our applications. Question for you. When we think about offboarding, certainly the department that the employee is leaving has things that they need to do. HR, your human resources people, they probably have some stuff they have to do um, with any of these groups. The IT department, for sure we want to know, right? Even though we're not often told in as timely manner as we'd like. Consider this. If you have somebody that works the front desk at City Hall or at your county offices, do they ever include that person? Maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, why would you care? Okay, I'll give you a scenario. We all have ID badges when we come to work. But if you've been working at a place three, four, five years, does that person at the front desk really honestly check that ID badge very closely? If they recognize you, they probably wave at you and say, hey, have a good day. Well, what if that person doesn't know that you're no longer with the organization? You come walking in one day, hey, how's it going? You just walk right in. So it's not just those departments that we typically think about that need to participate in this offboarding process. It's kind of a holistic thing for your organization, is it not? Yes? I was just going to say, it's interesting for us. Um, the voluntary separation tends to be more of a problem because the involuntary retirement, there's enough different departments that are involved in it that they sort of check each other. Mm -hmm. But with the involuntary, it's mostly up to their supervisor or manager to see that the clearance forms and all of those things are done. Mm -hmm. And then there's no one to necessarily check up on them because they're not all checking with each other. And those are the ones that we tend to see still sitting in the system. They haven't turned their keys in or their name badge or all of those sorts of things. Good point. So it may vary depending on the organization and the culture of the organization and the processes that you have in place. And, and don't forget about the contractor who has access within the organization that changes. That was, that was through uh, somebody utilized some contractor access, and if I remember right, it was an HVAC contractor. That's correct. I mean, it was not even somebody that was really doing target kind of work. They were an ancillary type contractor, but yet somebody was able to exploit the access that they had. So, yeah, very important for the integrity of the organization and the integrity of uh, your identity and access management system. This is, maybe makes you feel good and bad at the same time. 29% of organizations have an offboarding program in place. So about two thirds or better of us just don't have anything at all. So if you're sitting there kind of feeling bad and thinking, wow, we need to get on top of this, you're not alone. Lots of people um, don't do a very good job with this. And that's one of the reasons you should care. If we're effective at onboarding, it helps improve retention rates and reduces uh, some of the expenses that we incur when we're having to hire new people. Cost, I think, about four times sometimes as much to hire somebody new as it does to keep them and, and hang on to them. And certainly, one of our goals as an organization should be to try to hang on to good people. Right? And it also can improve employee time before productivity. There's research that shows if you have an effective onboarding process, you can get employees ramped up and productive about two months faster than if you don't. 
time is money. Particularly in the IT world, and if you're coming from a small IT shop, how important is it if there's only three of them and you just hired that third person brand new, how important is it for you to get that third person up to speed quickly? You don't want to be there a year later and that person still not be as productive as you'd like them to be, right? Um, how do y'all get notified um, as a group? I mean, anyone can speak up, but how do you get notified uh, when someone is new coming on board? I just got an email a moment ago saying, hey, Darren, we've got some new hires, and I get their names. That's about what it is. I created a um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Google Forms. It's free. Um, I created just a simple form that HR fills out in the onboarding process, and automatically, I mean, everything from our finance software, you know, you basically, <coughs> what software does this person need? Who is it supervised? You know, you, you click the, the, the drop down box and, you know, you fill it out, hit submit, it sends it to me uh, via email, and I take care of it and email the HR lady, hey, it's done, he's sitting in the desk and he's logged in, ready to roll. Do you have any resistance to that when you put the standards and HR push back off? No, sir. Uh, and, well, I've got. A pretty sweet gig in the fact that the HR director is my manager. Uh, so, <laughs> it worked out of that. But, you know, she's really um, like in my in my court, so to speak. If I have a good idea, or you know, I can come to her and, and kind of spitball and say, "Hey, I want to do this, or I want to do that." That was that was one idea that she really she really liked. Unfortunately, the way we have it at Brunswick right now, and we'll talk about what we're working on later, but um, we have an employee action form, a three-part paper, and the department head is supposed to fill that out, get approval from the manager, get approval from HR and so on, and HR is supposed to enter it in their system. When they enter it in their system, it sends us an email notification in IT. The problem is, is that HR will not enter it in until right before that employee starts. So it might be a Friday they enter it in and they start Monday. And that doesn't give us enough time to get a computer on their desk, give them access, set up email, and that time. Well, I think that speaks to what we were saying earlier. Both onboarding and offboarding are a process. If you're going to have an effective process, I think that that implies that you have mapped the process out you have all the steps identified, you have all of the participants and the stakeholders identified, and you have some time frames of when these steps need to occur. So if we're trying to get buy-in from the Human Resource Department, we would bring them in as a participant in uh, maybe a process mapping exercise, map that process out and help them to understand this is when these things need to happen. If they don't happen at this time, here's the impact on your IT group. We actually get a PE. We have two, two forms. We get a um, PE from each other. So and I can talk for all, all employee activities for that day. It includes everything from new hires, terminations, to name changes, to position changes, all that. For employees. Uh, for non employees, contractors, volunteers, blah, 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 name category. Those we have a, it's in book notes, but it's a form that's populated, which then kicks off the same process that allows us to change. Access and send emails where it's appropriate. So it's kind of a somewhat automated, but our, our real headache is offboard. We have a somewhat nice system on the front end, on board, but off board is kind of a crapshoot. You actually end up even knowing that they're leaving, especially I mean, your comment about the voluntary separation is being hard. But we have a hard time with because if the manager doesn't tell us, we don't know. Yeah. We have no idea. You know, and involuntary, we don't, they're very careful about times. You, know, you cut it off this time. So those are really easy. The voluntary, yeah, we're the same way. It's really hard to keep track of. Well, and there again, if we uh, if we think about this as a process, more than just an event, and we do some kind of mapping exercise and bring those stakeholders in, it'll help those department heads and it'll help HR in particular understand this is your role in this overall process, and here's why it's important. Because a lot of times, you know, they probably either don't understand why it's important, or you know, maybe. They kind of do, but they don't care because they got so much other stuff to do. Um, 
So I, I think there's going to have to be a little proactive action on IT's part maybe to go out there and help get these processes established and help the customer base understand why it's important to do what we're attempting to do. And you know, our low level, low level supervisors don't understand that if you don't turn it this count, you know, that's a license cost yeah. across countless systems and dollars wise we just keep paying for it until mm -hmm. they decide to tell us, well they left two months ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Or then you have an audit and somebody finds out that so and so has had access to the financial system for the past six months even though they were let go six months or, or voluntarily left six months ago. You, you sound like someone that's been through a hip audit like we, we never yeah. we never got told that that person wasn't here anymore. Well, and one of the problems I think you run into when accounts aren't taken away, do you, any of you have any issues with people sharing logins or sharing accounts, or maybe you've got somebody that they're the only person in the department that had access to a particular batch of data, and then they leave, and it's like, uh-oh, nobody else can get to that, so we've got to keep this account alive and keep using it. You know, that's when you go over there and spank some hands in the department, right? Because they shouldn't be sharing accounts to begin with. Well, if you think employees don't share passwords, uh, you know, think we're not living in the real world. Yeah. Um, just uh, a, a small point and uh, example of this. We put in a wireless network over at the courthouse, and while we were testing out, we gave our password to three people and said, we want you to test this out. We're going to test it for about two weeks and find out how things run. In two weeks' time, we have about 30 people. <laughs> so you know, it well for you. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. <laughs> it's a whole other ancillary issue, right? <laughs> so if we're effective with our onboarding, hopefully we can reduce the loss of intellectual property. And what we mean by that is we don't want folks leaving the organization or leaving the department and walking out with all the stuff in their head, right? Part of offboarding probably needs to be somewhere before a person leaves. We've got some processes in place to manage the knowledge that we have within the organization. So work processes are documented. Um, critical data is stored in such a fashion so that more than one person has access to it, more than one person knows how to perform the function, things like that. Again, this is a process. It can reduce the loss of physical property. How many of you guys feel like you do a really good job at asset management? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you don't know that an employee has this, this, and this piece of equipment, when they leave, how do you know whether they left it with you or walked out the door with it? You don't, right? <coughs> so asset management plugs in this whole thing. And it can reduce the risk of disgruntled employees bad press, people with an ax to grind. Again, if it is a strategically planned and thought out process, when somebody leaves an organization or they leave a department, you have a way to deal with that and people know what to expect. Right? We're not just kind of cutting them loose and throwing them out to the wind and whatever happens, happens. Okay. So, Number one issue that we face as an IT organization with onboarding, feel free to disagree with this. <laughs> we usually don't get timely notification from human resources. Because they're kind of the hub that this whole thing rotates around as far as bringing new people in or people moving around within the organization. If anybody knows, HR's got to know, right? They, they, they have to. Yeah, because usually they're going to they're gonna be plugged into payroll, and if nothing else happens, we're going to pay employees. Because for sure, if you don't do that, you'll find out about it, right? That's the one thing you are going to have to do. <coughs> so they don't always get that information to us downstream in a timely fashion. And that has negative impacts on hardware and software procurement. If we don't know folks are coming, then how can we have the hardware that they need in place? If it's a new employee, Maybe we've got to place an order and get that stuff in. Uh, if somebody's transferred from one department to another, what are your policies? Does that person bring their equipment with them or do they leave it in the department? And then the new department has to make sure that they have a, uh, hardware and software that they need. It just depends on how you got that set up. But for sure, you've got to consider that, right? Desktop, hardware and software set up, same thing. Yeah. 
You ever had an employee show up and sit down at their desk and we didn't have any kind of computer hardware for them to work on? Or they don't have a phone? And you know what they think? IT has dropped the ball. They haven't got me set up. I'm here for two day work. And the department has said, well, we're waiting on IT to get your computer set up and you can set up. Yeah. So we've become the bad guys from right off the get-go. We require the hiring manager to be responsible for getting all of that before the person comes. How'd you manage that? It's part of our onboarding system that so you walk emails that tells them once the offer's gone out, this is the day they're going to be starting. We have this long, we have protocols in place. So you put some accountability back on them. That way they can't throw dirt on, on the IT department. And, you know, if you're in that situation where that new person shows up, maybe they don't have a phone, they don't have a computer, their uh, supervisor says, well, we're waiting on IT, what impression does that give that person of IT right off the bat? Hey, uh, how willing are they going to be to call you when they have an issue? Because it's already been planted in their mind, IT doesn't know what they're doing, or they're slow, or they're non-responsive. Right? So it's a big issue for us. I was going to say to that point on the opposite, uh, if you do have staff that come on board and you do have everything ready, including all the software, it completely changes their attitude toward IT and then they're speaking phrases. Mm -hmm. We had a recent hire. It doesn't always work that way, but we were able to get ahead of it and they come in and it's the best thing ever. So it's they become good. a champion for the department. So them and them for everybody. It makes yeah. the department look good, it makes IT look good, it makes the county or city look good. Yeah, because it has a negative reflection on the whole organization. If you as a new employee come in and it looks like they weren't ready for you, and you're sitting there saying, well, I told you I was coming three weeks ago. What have you guys been doing the last three weeks? And, you know, maybe they've got mobile devices that we've got to set up for them, uh, phones, email, you know, any other applications that uh, we need to set up for them with passwords, any kind of uh, shared data, things like that. What happens when we fail at this? Well, we end up with an appointment with the Bureau of Eternal Frustration, right? That's kind of the impression that people get of IT when they call us. And then IT ends up with a lot of stress on their plate, right? You guys have seen that before. Steve, I think this is where you said you wanted to pick it up, right? All four? the number one issue that IT faces with onboarding plus the number one issue that they face with offboarding. Exact like same thing. So what happens, to go off this slide, uh, and this occurs, what else? I know it sounds goofy, but communicate with IT. Um, we had talked about some people have electronic solutions set up, and some people still use paper. Um, regardless of whether you're killing trees or using, you know, a, a solution, electronic solution, it still falls down, I believe, when it comes to buying. I am from your HR department. I am from management, so because. If you can't get a department head to fill out a form in a timely manner, manner and you can't get HR to input in the system in a timely manner, you're going to have the same problem, whether it's paper or whether it's electronic. So what are some things to consider with offboarding? How many people think offboarding is more important than onboarding? And why do you think that? Security. Security, that's the main thing, right? Well, what are some of the things y'all consider when someone goes off boarding? Email, of course. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them. What about Wi-Fi access? Mm -hmm. Secure Wi-Fi access. How many people change that password periodically? Or maybe every month, every six months? 
here's a big one. I have Facebook accounts for the department and so on. So there's some people that manage Facebook accounts for, say, the health department, and they might be the only one that has that username and password. And what happens then whenever they go off boarding and they don't share that with you? Have you ever tried to take over a Facebook page? Mm -hmm. You can't do it. You can't talk to anybody. You're stuck. You're dead in the water. Um, we had a situation uh, with the county not long ago where we had a person that worked for economic development. They had their own website. They had their own Facebook, Twitter. They had LinkedIn, and the person that left, luckily we were able to retrieve some of the passwords. Some of them we went in and, and basically played, you know, did it around the top way. We said we forgot our password, and luckily it emailed, you know, a change of password to their county email address. But they had their Facebook page, they had their LinkedIn, all of that tied to their personal account. Mm -hmm. And she was the only one that had the password. So you have to really consider that. We talk about mobile devices, uh, uh, good inventory of mobile devices. Um, let's see, one of the, I can't even read uh, Active Directory. We got hit with a HIPAA audit, and I mentioned that when you were speaking earlier, um, not long ago. And one of the things they really hit us with is we had a lot of NAC or employees that were listed in NAC directory that were no longer with the county only because we were never notified. Never notified. Of course, your computer access. What about your mobile devices? Um, how many people use stipends or give out county or uh, company phones? Those that give out stipends, um, do y'all uh, allow them to get their email, their work email on their phone and so on? Uh, you have to think about all that access. Bring your own device. How many people use bring your own device? Do you have to worry about that with not for them? From an email perspective in particular. Yeah. <coughs> what about access, physical access. Um, do y'all uh, have card swipes in most of your buildings? Or I know the county currently, our, our county, we're putting card swipes on all our buildings. And we're tying it all into Active Directory. And we're doing single sign-on so that um, if someone leaves the county, we only have to change one password, and it changes that as well. Question for you there too, Steve. When you talk about access, physical access to buildings, um, how about hard keys? Maybe not for exterior doors, but for interior doors. Who manages that? Does IT manage that, or does another entity within the organization? Somebody else. Thank God. <laughs> you know, again, there's another player in that whole offboarding process that you need to make sure you include mm -hmm. so you get those hard keys back because you don't want to go changing the locks on them, however many doors that key fits, right? How many people utilize a password for their phone and their voicemail? Yeah. What about anything on the cloud? Um, there are people in the health department that have access to um, health records and so on through the state system. There's NC FAST with DSS, and um, we, we use Northwood's cloud-based system. Um, they can access from anywhere. So you have to think about those passwords. Shared folders. And, of course, your administrators. Let's look at email. How many people set forwarding for a period of time on their email when someone leaves? Yeah. And we usually have a supervisor to decide if they want it forwarded or if they just want access to read it or mm -hmm. the supervisor to decide. And it does very much depend on the position. 
Yeah, and I don't have any right or wrong answers. I mean, there, or there's no right or wrong answers, I don't think. Uh, I'm not here to give you solutions. I'm just trying to show you some of the things that we experience at our county, and I'm trying to learn from you as well as you learn from us. Um, we do a gamut of things, like you said. It all depends on the employee, the position, who's requesting it, and so on. Um, Sometimes we put it into a shared mailbox. Um, Y'all said auto responses that this employee is no longer with you. Yeah. Um, or do you download the email to just a PST? So, I mean, there's different ways, but um, we now, um, we have Microsoft 365 with Exchange on the cloud, and we actually put, a, uh, put it on legal hold. And it retains it basically forever until we say, do away with it. And what about remote device? And what information they have on there, maybe health records or what have you. Um, they have their own mobile device. You may give them a stipend. Some people may not even give them a stipend. They might just use their mobile device. Do you wipe it clean? Steve, I want to ask the group on this on the mobile device. We're trying for social services uh, based on Apple ID uh, not being able to reset them. Is treating them like keys, and the user actually is wiping their device before they hand it over. So if we don't see the device with the color screen, they have formally turned in all of their equipment. And then they're just trying that. We're, we're testing it now just to see if that's what happens. For mobile devices, we, if it's a county issued device, we generally require them to set it up with a county uh, email address for an Apple ID. And then we, if we need to do a reset on it, we can we can grab that email and do a reset and take care of the password. We were trying to do that as well, but we were trying to put the burden back on them and say, you know, this is your, that was our, taking the key off the key ring. Right that was our mobile and had its preferred office to require them to use a county email, and that way we have control to do these things. And he's doing something that Verizon and Apple have the ability to do, I forget what he called it, but it's a more advanced thing, which allows them to do the reset without knowing the Apple ID password. So some other things to look at. Does anybody wipe the device totally? He will wipe them once he gets into the table. Yeah. And if it's BYOD, we will wipe um, the application specifically. Yeah. We'll wipe somebody away. Because it may not just be email, it's on the device. Yeah, we have policies to prevent um, document exporting out of email into other apps on BYOD, so it's all contained within the uh, store. It's pretty safe to wipe that. All right, so you have a variety of emails to think about, the main administrator, shared files and drive, and you have your cloud services, uh, what we talked about earlier. Um, again, I, I can't stress enough the need to, if you have someone that is running Facebook or something for a department in your city, county, whatever government entity you are, that there's someone else that has that password. I know we don't want to like sharing passwords, but you may end up in a situation where you ha might have Brunswick County Economic Development Facebook page here. You can't get rid of it. You have to develop a new one over here. Phone, what you talk about. What about copy your scanners? Do y'all have security codes that y'all use for any of those devices? We do. Do we ever wipe it clean or take, take that password off when someone leaves? We haven't. We should. And it's for secure Wi-Fi and security codes. And not just your card swipe. Some of us have those old codes where you have the buttons and you push the buttons. Those need to be changed. The mobile device is not attached to the domain. Okay, 
access. One of the main causes of security breaches are disgruntled former employees. That's true, the internet will tell you that, they don't lie. <laughs> <coughs> so even some, some of your most timid employees, someone that you wouldn't think would do anything, if they leave in, in a not so pleasant situation with your organization, if things aren't done properly, Sometimes a good person can turn into a bad person, real quick. So, this is a good point. Those that are using the cloud for more and more services, more and more logins, it's vital to have IT as a major component of the operating process. So you must consider user applications, Access not granted by IT might be granted by the state or what have you. Um, administrators, you have administrators that may give out passwords to employees within a certain department to make sure they're included in the operating process. And collect all assets. I noticed that when he asked the question about asset, uh, assets a while ago, that not a person in here raised their hand. And I'm one of them. I think that's one of our shortfalls when it comes to IT, is proper as asset management. Um, and there are a lot of devices, as you can see, and it's very costly. 300 million in assets lost every year. That's the offboarding employees. I think that's another reason, as we mentioned earlier, if you think about an employee that's a configuration item, all the assets that you assign to them or characteristics of that employee, and if you catalog all that up front, then when it comes time to take access away or recover assets, you've got that stuff cataloged. What happens, you know, if you issue, you're probably pretty good at laptops and things like that, but these things all have a shelf life, right? We upgrade hardware periodically. How do you know when it's time to upgrade if you don't know what that person's got and how long they've had? I mean, there's just a whole laundry list of, of things that are connected to having good asset management. And unfortunately, all of those things don't necessarily belong to one department. Right. That's right. Which makes it more difficult. And not all those things may not attach to your network. You know, I know a lot of you probably here go in and can see all the computers on your network and so on run those report. But there are some devices that never attach to your network, that field worker out in the field or what have you. What about them? So, that's a big number, 300 million. Again, the internet don't lie. Where is that at? Is it in America or across the nation? That's in America. <laughs> so, what do you do? And um, again, with us, it depends on the situation. But do you disable the user or do you delete it? And he had mentioned access to the facility earlier. You know, that person at the front desk, say like the one at health department, when we went through our HIPAA audit, one of the things that we got hit up on is that um, he walked through this day, and the next day he walked through without checking in. They saw his face, they knew who he was. Hey, how you doing? Have a good day. <coughs> well, he could have departed the company between the first time he came and the second time he came. So when we went through the HIPAA audit, we got zinged with that one. Again, contractors, contract employees, we don't uh, think about them very often, but um, workers tra change contracts in. Um, what about data transfer from a former employee to a new employee? Do y'all do any of that? How 
how long do y'all keep it? I mean, that's another thing. It depends on the position. The higher the level, the more it keeps. Manage your yeah. With, with department heads, we tend to keep it uh, in well internally, yeah. but not hard. Uh, keep it uh, forever. But with your normal employees, we may keep it a month, two months. Would it depend on what the data is based on the public record law? The, their jobs and everything. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get more people to. Uh, push their documents to the cloud instead of retaining it on their device so that when they do leave, we don't have to worry about, you know, it's stored on the device or what have you, um, and it keep it forever if we want to. And audit com compliance, uh, again, we went through a HIPAA audit, and uh, how many have gone through one of those? Well, if you haven't, you will soon because it's becoming a requirement. That you're, if you're in a county, your health department is required now to have a HIPAA audit, uh, I think, once a year. And that HIPAA audit will definitely include IT. What are some of the adverse impacts? Let's say if they really go through that audit and they <coughs> down. Uh, there's a lot of things that you're about to watch on. Okay, then what? The, they gave us, um, actually, we're, we're just now getting through with it. We had till the end of June to complete everything from the audit. And not one of the items that they pointed out was something that we said, gosh, we don't need to be doing this. It's stuff that we should have been doing. So, really, it was a benefit to us. It, gave us recognition as to some things that we should have been done, doing differently or had not been doing at all. And it also solidified with HR and management the importance of notifying IT on the cloud for. It was almost like something that we could use as a leverage. I said I went to Austin pretty soon and did hip audits there, but the, there was dollar impacts to failed hip audits. I mean, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement dollars tiered down as long as you had violations of the it, Here's the catch from my understanding, and I'm not with the health department, but if you don't comply with the HIPAA audit, it can affect your dollars that you get from state and federal government. And that's where they get you. Yeah. Yeah. Find asset management went through a federal program audit, and that, that serves to go before our board and say, Okay. How many people have had uh, your government website and a person's been gone for three months and their name's still up? There's a contact. It happens. So what can we do? Well, with the, our county, we're trying to tie everything into Active Directory so that we get one call, we can change again one password, it changes everything. Um, single sign on. Um, have a strong on onboarding offboarding practice, and again, management buy-in is uh, really the key, I believe. Um, automate as much of, of the process as possible. We're doing that in Brunswick. I'll talk about that in just a minute. I think uh, you have a solution that y'all have been working on or, or have in place. Um, and you want me to speak about laser fish? Right? Yeah, while you're up there, go ahead and talk about what you guys are doing with laser fish. Okay. Um, we actually have been in a laser fish shop for, I'd say, about six years. And laser fish, we used it mainly, I think, like most people, just as a repository. Um, you know, scan a document, index, and get being able to pull it up, you know, by your index and fields and so on. And we found out it was so much more. Um, and we actually built a laser fish workflow for our central permitting uh, in the county 
And so all of our central permitting and the department's tied up to the permitting process and inspection process is in with that. And we learned a lot going through that. And so now we're building an employee action form using laser fish with the workflow. And a critical part of that is IT notification within that workflow. And we're, again, in the development stages of that. Um, Carteret County, uh, they built that already. Um, we've actually have now uh, been forming a, those that are laser fish uh, users here be interested in we, We're building a laser fish uh, team that will actually work on different workflows. Uh, we've got one team, hopefully we're going to set up to, to work on the employee action form and then that will be shared with everybody that is also using laser fish in, in the state and also working on other processes. So we're going to probably um, uh, sit down with Ray Hall with Carteret County and some others that have been working on this as well. Uh, City of Wilmington is another. And we're going to probably build something together uh, to resolve some of these issues that we were talking about today. Um, that's what we're doing in Brunswick. So we're taking a proactive approach now to it. And Ray, you had some, I mean, I talked about it. Chris, you had something that you wanted to talk about. Yeah. So um, I think Steve has a pretty good process or a technical solution there in Brunswick County. And we heard uh, mention of some Google Forms, similar, sounds like similar technical approach to this. I want to talk just a little bit, this one point we made here about having uh, strong onboarding and offboarding practice with management buy-in. Some of the things that we've been able to do in the city of Fayetteville, how many of you have some kind of new employee orientation when you bring people into the organization? Most of them, right? How long does that last? So it could vary from half a day to a day to a couple of days, right? A little bit all over the board. For us, typically it lasted about a day and a half. IT, up until, well, not yet, but until now, we would get anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes out of that day and a half. Mm -hmm. It all depended on how much time it took people to sign up for their benefits, and then we were the cow's tail. You know, we got, we got what was left over, and if it was getting close to lunch, we better hurry up and talk fast, okay? Um, you got Ulysses Crawford sitting back right there. You raise your hand, Ulysses, and then Willie Johnson next to him. They're there, our customer relationship managers in Fayetteville. Ulysses and I, um, at one time, were handling that new employee orientation piece of the IT piece of it. Um, and we recognized, what, probably three years ago, that there was a need for IT to have a bigger piece of that new employee orientation process. And so we had talked to the HR folks and tried to at least get a defined time for us, not to be an afterthought. Took about three years. Ulysses is very persistent. They have finally expanded new employee orientation to two days, and IT is going to have about an hour and a half now, right? It goes to an hour. Oh, about an hour. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Better than 15 minutes, anyhow. They gave us two hours and took one. <laughs> Some of the things that uh, we plan to talk about there are uh, help desk support. The city intranet, security, firewalls, shared drives, uh, the city website, your logging credentials. Hopefully, you'll have an opportunity to let people practice logging in uh, and any other questions that they might have. So, that's one advance that we've made. The other thing that we've done, remember, we talked about onboarding being a process. <coughs> it can't stop after that four hours or two days or whatever it is. And so what IT has done, this has been in for, what, about a year now? Somewhere around there. We actually pick up, once that person comes into the IT department, they are assigned a mentor. It <coughs> depends on what section of IT they fall into. But they are assigned a mentor who then helps guide that person <coughs> through learning about compliance and culture and connections and those, all those C's that we talked about. That mentor is also responsible for lining up people 
in all the various aspects of IT to do a short presentation for that employee to help them understand what is done across the whole department. So if you come in and you're on the help desk, we still want you to understand what project managers do. We still want you to understand what the developers are doing. We want you to get that holistic picture of IT. That process lasts, kind of depends on how quickly we can ramp a person up, four to six months. Okay. But then there are also check-ins over the course of the whole year. Usually about every quarter you want to check in. And we had talked about having those job results developed up front. Typically, what HR wants us to do is develop those job results early on, review those with the employee. They'll be reviewed again at six months, and then again at the end of the year probation. So that's kind of an example of what I think is a, is a pretty decent onboarding process. It spans about a year, but I, I think it's, it's a good model to build on. Uh, as far as the process. Offboarding can't speak quite as well about that. We're still kind of struggling with that, mainly because as Steve pointed out, it's that cooperation from the other departments. So you really, I think as an IT department, have to be an advocate for how important that process is. Maybe go as far as to champion doing the process mapping with all the stakeholders and get that process defined. And, and I mentioned laser fish, and that's only the solution that we're using. Uh, just note on that next to the last bullet point, I mean, some of you may be SharePoint um, users. Um, you can do certainly do some of the same things in SharePoint as well. as uh, There's vendor supply solutions, and you'll probably see that a lot of them do utilize SharePoint, those vendor supply solutions. But um, anyway, just don't think that laser fish is the only thing out there. The, uh, the Laserfish solution uh, is uh, we, we use Laserfish in house and full transparency. Like I, I don't touch it unless I have to because I, mean, I, I really don't use it. But in this instance, like you said, it, it's it's helpful more than hurtful. Um, is that a plug-in or module that goes along with it, or um, you're talking about what we're developing, yes, or there, there's different. Um, uh, products within Laserfish, and um, depending on what process you're, you're trying to work out, you may have to use different products. They have like a web link product and so on. If you're trying to post stuff out on the web and, and have people fill out forms and populate within Laserfish. So you have to really look at the whole Laserfish product line and see which best suits your needs. Um, because right now we're just using our a well, if you will, after uh, this session, just deal with me tonight, um, and I don't mind saying this tonight, we're having a meeting at 730 of our laser fish group, um, and um, we do have one or two more seats open, and I'd be happy for you to join us and learn more about what we're doing, what other counties are doing. One thing you need to do is it can be very complex. Yes. You have to be very careful, and you know there's ways of maybe saving money on some license by, by say the web link or something, pointing people that. So you have to really sit down and look at what your needs are, and maybe work with somebody in the license. You should make sure you It can be very complex as far as license. I'll make one last point here because I know we're getting to the bottom of the hour. Um, and this was something in the conversation I had uh, with our uh, CIO earlier today. It's really in your best interest to talk to your customer base and encourage other departments to follow some kind of onboarding process beyond whatever HR does. And maybe even help them with that because the more you can teach employees up front, about how to deal with issues, the fewer calls maybe you're going to have to your help desk six months down the road. So if you can take some of that traffic off your help desk, then you can move on to do more and other productive things. So I think IT can really be a model and a champion in the organization for a robust onboarding and offboarding process. It's just, you just got to kind of keep plugging and see if you can get that culture to change and get those other departments to buy into it. Yeah, we, we've gotten better in Brunswick, and uh, his point, you know, we have
have gone to the department heads and we have talked to them about the importance and why you need to not rely on HR to notify us. You notify us just as soon as you know that this person's coming on. Uh, we still are struggling with a few departments, still have uh, a department that I'll call and say so and so came in today and we don't have no satellite for yet, we didn't notify you. So we still have that and that's even people that we talk to. But things have gotten better to this point because we did get out and we did talk to Any other questions or comments? Discussion? We certainly appreciate all of you showing up. We're glad to have a full house. And hopefully this has been helpful and spur some thoughts. And maybe we can, uh, down the road, if you have best practices and come from that work really well, we appreciate it. I'm so to everybody else. That's the purpose of that, right? It's a message, not the